uh, Robert Wright from the Financial Times. Um, can I raise a quick point about uh, you, what you said about Scotland? Um, it strikes me that the general election debate in Scotland was not as much about Brexit as it was in other parts of the country, and actually an awful lot of the debate was frustration about the SNP's failures in government rather than specifically the constitutional issues. Obviously, the SNP is a is a walking constitutional issue, but uh, and and how it stands is uh, obviously is a statement about the constitution. But um, I wonder how that fits with your argument. Uh, and also, you talked about um, the potential for for Scotland to have a, a cost cost free exit from the union. Um, the fact remains that Scotland, in most uh, calculations, gets a nine billion pounds fiscal transfer from the union. Um, and that has been uh, an issue that has come and gone in Scottish politics. Sometimes people have glossed over it, but um, it remains the fact. Most people would say that it's, it's not going to be cost-free for yeah. Scotland to to leave. Yes, no, there, that, you're absolutely right. Let me deal with the first, this more, in a sense, more technical question, uh, the second one first, which is, of course, yes. But on the other hand, I, I was really uh, painting with a broad brush. I was thinking about not not exactly, you know, these questions of where a certain amount of money comes from, because they're rather complicated. For example, a Scotland, independent Scotland within the EU, uh, might get various EU money directly. Who knows? It could negotiate all sorts of things. It's an open question. What it couldn't do, uh, and this was my point, again, speaking very broadly, what it couldn't do, uh, clearly, was possess the same kind of easy and straightforward integration with England, which it possesses at the moment, and which it would possess uh, were both England and Scotland to be within the EU, but both independent of one another. Which I think incidentally is the right way to put this. I don't think we should talk about Scotland being independent of England, because as various people observe, it's an act of union. <laughs> and although the English behaved at the time as if Scotland had to accommodate itself to English constitutional and political practices, there's no reason in principle why that had to be the case. Uh, on the, f the first question, again, um, it, of course, that's, that's going to be right, but uh, it took place in a setting where, if you like, that kind of politics could reappear. Uh, the, the constitutional issue was, or at least people might have supposed until recent weeks, was actually off the agenda. And so uh, the force, in a way, of the SNP position is reduced, and therefore, of course, people naturally concentrate on and tell the opinion pollsters that they are most caring about the conventional political failings of the SNP. That's exactly what you would expect. Were the thing now off the agenda? I think it's, it, it, so you can turn this around the other way. You can say it's evidence that independence was off the agenda, that people didn't talk much about independence. Gentlemen of front, name an organization. Khalid Mahmood, Member of Parliament for Birmingham, Perry Bar. Your panacea to the left of the Brexit, uh, I find a bit of a contradiction when you say that this is exactly the way that the left should move forward to do this. Isn't it safer for the left if they were still to remain within the European Union where they enact the legislation which then we can't amend on our own and has to go through Europe to be able to amend it. So therefore, the ECJ, the issues around the working time directives, all of those things that we want to do that, rather than rely on a ping pong politics of once we get in first time round and then second time round the conservatives get in and they repeal that again. So isn't it better for if, if we were uh, looking at our socialist policy to lock the UK in through Europe? Well, uh, sure, now I can see the temptation, and that's been a, a constant theme in the history of the Labour Party for the last 30 odd years. But locking yourself into structures is risky. You can't pick and choose. Uh, you lock yourself into some, which you like, but you lock yourself into others which you don't like. Um, and I, so that even on pract practical basis, I think if you look with a reasonably clear head at the way that uh, ECJ judgments has been going on workers' rights in the last 10 years or so, um, you know, Viking Lines case and all that sort of stuff, Laval, uh, it, they, they tend to push away from what most people in, on the left in Britain would regard as ways of guaranteeing the position of workers in the face of international competition. Um, I, I also think, actually, that, um, well, two things in, in a way about this business of locking in. 
Um, partly, I just uh, I feel there's something kind of wrong about not having a fair fight. This is, this is the objection, in a way, to the American system. And it, cre it creates many distortions, because it's not a fair fight. You were fighting all the time in, in, within the structures which were the result of a victory a generation or more ago. And that skews everything. Um, and it, it, it has a slightly rather corrupting effect on people. People become irresponsible. I think you can see that in the present administ uh, American administration. Uh, though you've, you can actually see it in many uh, earlier administrations. If in the end there is a fallback, if in the end someone is going to tell you what to do, if these structures exist, you can be incredibly irresponsible. Uh, and no, you know, the, no harm will come. The, the judges will sort it out. Um, and that can also produce a, a, a greater, in a sense, a greater extremism, passion. Again, you can see that in American politics. You know, people kill over abortion, right? Uh, here, abortion was settled by parliamentary vote. I, mean, I think it's not, again, it's not a magic feature of you know, British political culture. That it doesn't produce that kind of violence. It's a straightforward in consequence of the institution. Uh, abortion, is, abortion rights are locked in. They are off the, off the table, and for good or ill, and people resent that. So, I mean, I think that one of the reasons that's sort of the back of my mind in what I've been arguing and thinking more generally in this area is really arises from a thought about um, the oddity of the fact that this, that Britain has what on the face of it, or had uh, in, in, in its, so to speak, classic period, uh, it had an institution of absolutely stunning power. Right, you know, Leslie Stephen says that par a parliamentary act can put to death all blue-eyed babies, and it's a valid act. John Selden, back in the 17th century, said parliamentary statute could make it a capital offense to stay in bed after 8 o'clock in the morning, and that's a valid act. That's a very, very unusual structure. And you might suppose that it's a nightmare structure, right? It's giving enormous power to a legislature. But I think it's also fair to say, on the whole, with many obvious exceptions, the history of Britain has been a relatively liberal story. Is that a coincidence? Do you need a certain kind of political culture to have that sort of institution? Or, what I would say, that sort of institution produces that kind of political culture. Because it means that nothing is ever settled for good you are never going to lose decisively. You can live to fight another day, and so on. I think that just has enormous merits from the point of view of general politics. Now, paradoxically, I think the reason why, I mean, Dean and I were talking about this earlier before the, the talk, and I think we've all experienced it. The, the reason why I think we all feel there's something very unpleasant in the air at the moment. There's a kind of viciousness. People lose their friends and so on. I think that's because, actually, we have been considering, we had to consider something which is decisive for a generation. And it produces that kind of anxiety and antagonism. Now, as I said in the lecture, one of the paradox here is, at least I take the Brexit vote to be, a, it, it's a constitutional vote of a modern kind. The people as a whole have voted. But what they've done is to say, go give us something like the Constitution we used to have go back to something like the sort of parliamentary government we used to have. Now, of course, it will no longer be, so to speak, something which is intrinsically legitimate. It's a bit like, I think, what is in effect the position of the monarchy today, which is we could get rid of the monarchy. And we would have a referendum. And I think we would say if it went against the monarchy, the monarchy's done for. Right? So the monarchy exists on sufferance. But by and large, I think it, you know, a vote would probably go in favor. Even if there isn't a vote, as I said, there's a sense in which there's a kind of dummy vote in favor. And I think something like that has happened in the case of Parliament. Parliament is no longer sovereign in the old sense. Uh, it's sovereign, in, but it's the sovereign, sovereignty, in my terminology, the terminology of the people I write about, is vested in the people as a whole. But the people as a whole have, in some sense, said, we don't want elaborate constitutional structure. We want to be able to fight this out on the floor of the Commons every five years. So that's my general response to that. Gentleman there in the front. Yeah. No.
name an organization. Uh, Mark Glendening, Policy Exchange. Um, I'd be interested to know what your analysis is concerning why it is that so many on the modern center-left um, adhere to this contradiction of supporting a vaguely defined transnationalism, mm. while on the other hand, wishing to enact policies that clearly, as you've articulated, cannot legally now be imposed through an elected center-left government. What we seem to have experienced is a complete collapse in ideological and relational thinking on the center-left. And could it be that the Corbyn period might actually see a revival in rationalist leftism, well, regardless of whether we agree with it or not. Yeah, no, that's exactly content. what I think. I mean, I agree with it, but I'm perfectly aware that you might not. You know, I have very good friends who wouldn't. Noel wouldn't. I mean, sure. But I think, but nevertheless, I think all of us could say it's better to have these things argued out. It's better to have the fair fight. And what's happened is that we haven't. Now, the, 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 the question you ask is enormously important. And I've touched on possible explanations of it, and there's a huge variety of explanations. First of all, it's, it's a Europe-wide phenomenon, and I would say it's a Western-wide phenomenon. I mean, it's not clear the Democrat Party is in any better shape as a center-left movement than the pre-Corbyn Labour Party was. I mean, there's been a turning against center-left center parties uh, across the world, or at least across the Western world. Uh, I mean, the continent is a spectacular example of that. Um, and I mean, at one level, of course, it's very natural because it's perfectly reasonable to think that, as I say in the lecture, they look like a managerial class for late-stage capitalism. I mean, they're just an alternative one. You know, give us, give us the power and we'll do slightly different things. But the, the electorate can sort of see that they're roughly speaking the same kinds of people with very similar policies. And eventually, that logic has to work its way out. Um, I think that's probably as important as anything else. Once you put yourself into these constraining structures, the center-left is bound to fall, I think. I mean, that's in a way been the point of this argument, that this is not a necessarily an exogenous, um, uh, a, 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 a sort of uh, phenomenon, but it's caused by the very structures which the left mistakenly signed up to. In, in the States, of course, they're very long-standing. So in a way, they signed up to the New Deal, various re reorderings of the, of the structures. Um, but certainly in Europe, they, they all signed up to these structures. And the structures, I think, have, the logic of the structures worked their way through and left the center left powerless. And then the electorate thinks, well, they're powerless. Well, they just want personal power. They don't seem to be doing anything for us. Uh, and so you find a turn against them. All that seems to be entirely reasonable, actually. Um, I mean, there are other things. There's, there's, uh, I think the lack. I mean, so I have been wondering whether well-known and documented fact, which is the freezing of social mobility, upward social mobility, again across the world, across the Western world, it, uh, since the well, to some degree, even since the war, you know, uh, but certainly since the Trente Glorieuse, since since the post-war years. Um, has a work again works its way out in complicated ways psychologically. That you, you have a sort of left establishment that is much, I mean, very many important exceptions to this, of course. But nevertheless, there's a lot of people who haven't got a very clear sense, an intimate sense, of uh, what it's like not to be part of this particular class. And that wasn't always true. People's grandparents or parents. Uh, were industrial laborers. They themselves were industrial laborers. I mean, there was a sort of intimacy, knowledge, which I sometimes think has vanished. So th that's another possibility. The, the whole, we could talk m endlessly about that. I think it's a really interesting, important question. Lots of different possibilities. But I think the institutional explanation is important. I think it's the most important part of the explanation, and it's something we can fix. We might not be able to fix social mobility so easily, but we can fix the institution. I just get a sense of how many more questions people are looking for. I'm just going to have to disappoint some people. I'm afraid I'll have to be in a vulnerable moment. There's a gentleman at the very far back, way in the back. By the many wall. gentlemen, OK. <laughs> yeah. we'll, take, we'll take them as a clutch geographically. But gentleman at the back, then the gentleman in the penultimate row. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Name and organization, please. Yes, my name is Gunnar Beck. I'm teaching uh -huh. EU law at SOAS, and otherwise I'm a migrant Eurosceptic. <laughs> Um, now, uh, thank you very much for your illuminating talk. It, for, uh, amongst many other things, um, used the term left in a mm. sense in which I can still uh, attach some meaning to. Um, now, of course, and I'm just uh, voicing just a few things and perhaps invite you to uh, comment on what you think about these slight reinterpretations of some of the things you've said. First of all, of course, what we have is that there is uh, considerable opposition to the European Union amongst those, both in the Conservative Party and in the Labour Party, yes. who still attach some meaning to these terms conservative in the sense that there is a commitment to the nation and traditional social structures and in the Labour Party to redistribution, as opposed to those who care very little about either and, ex uh, 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 and seem to focus entirely, shall we say, sexual minority rights yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, tax exemptions yeah. for city organizations. And then the second point, or uh, I, I'd like to uh, just briefly highlight, is what we have, uh, uh, of course, this willingness to farm out decisions to the European Union, I mean, which is perhaps the most important aspect of this process, can of course be found in very many other mm. political phenomena as well. Yes, I'm thinking absolutely. A, in terms of say the willingness in which, uh, with which vast areas of economic policy are uh, surrendered uh, 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 willingly to central banks. Absolutely. And then secondly, uh, the <laughs> sorry, and then secondly, the judicial <laughs> deference, sorry. And, and secondly, the deference of the politicians yes. shown to supreme courts Very when good. it comes Absolutely. to the judicial enforcement Absolutely. of socially totally <laughs> unacceptable <laughs> policy preferences. Yes. Other yes. gentlemen there at the back. I'm do you want to do you, you want to gather questions? Is that no, the idea? Okay. Well, last question, I'm afraid. We're, uh, having, we're, okay. we're melting up here. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, David Williamson, the, the Western Mail. Um, Labour has been in power in Wales um, mm. since 1999 mm. and has consciously um, described clear red water flowing. So there's a, a left-wing trajectory that uh, hasn't been followed in, in Westminster during this time. And, and it's fair to say that uh, Carbon Jones was, is now you know, very open to the idea of voting, of, of, of leading the Assembly and refusing to consent to the repeal bill. And one of the great mm. fears is, is that we have one of the poorest areas of Britain, but it's benefited hugely from being able to receive funds directly from Brussels without having to go through Westminster. And could you actually say to left politicians in Wales that they have a higher chance of ending endemic poverty that's existed for the last 50 years outside the EU? It's a, it's a good, well, can I, I, can I deal perhaps with, with Gunnar Beck's questions first? So I think the question you raise about devolution, well, particularly well, Wales rather than Scotland, I think is very interesting. Um, but look, I, I think I agree with almost everything you say, actually. Uh, and indeed, as I said, I, in my own, I think, is a matter for another day would be a discussion about the dangers of Supreme Court. Uh, I, you know, I don't think it's an accident that Blair created a new kind of Supreme Court, although theoretically. It's the Judi Judicial Committee of the House of Lords. Sort of psychically, it's kind of different. And, and I think that's going to work its way out. Um, so yes, the EU is not the only uh, example of this. And I mean, I, I many years ago, I actually wrote something about post-democracy, which was precisely about these things like central banks, constitutional courts, and the EU as playing this role in which politicians abdicate. And I think there is, again, going back to the, uh, the question about what happened to the center-left more generally, I think there is a kind of, I mean, there's a sort of abdication from politics, both to some degree theoretically, you know, the market, there's always been an antagonism, if you like, between the market and the state, I think. Um, and the idea that the market can solve all our distributional problems rather than express this political decision has been a very powerful idea. There's been a sort of turn away from politics. The turn away from politics is expressed, and, and there's a theoretical basis for this. Many of my colleagues, for example, think it's irrational to vote. I 
think the opposite. In fact, he once wrote a book trying to say that it is, in fact, rational to vote. But it's widely believed it's not rational to vote. Well, if it's not rational to vote, that's going to remove most of the basis for traditional democratic politics. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a wide phenomenon. But it, it's a kind of bootstrapping. Put yourself into these institutions, and they make it less likely that you will seize back, if you like, political agency. And the Brexit case was a case where, for once, it looked as if we could throw the thing into reverse in a major area. We could throw this huge impediment, this outsourcing of politics, into reverse and hope that we could reintroduce politics. And then, as I said, we fight it out. I would like the left to win. I can see it won't always win. I don't want the left to win by locking into perpetuity or near perpetuity what it wants. Because as I said uh, in response to the first question, that is a very dangerous route to go down. Wales, I think, is, is, a, is an interesting case. I mean, all, and it relates in a way to the first point I was making uh, about the difficulty of talking about you know, uh, root money and the, and the flow of money. Um, because it's, I mean, it, one of the things that economists are good at, I find, but the general public is not, is, if you like, being aware that you can't hold one thing stable and change other things. Everything changes. I mean, the a proper way of thinking about the economy is everything is moving in different ways. It's extremely hard to say what sorts of channels would send money to Wales if there actually was an end to the EU and replacement of some of the current institutions for distribution by UK institutions and so on. Um, I think myself that Wales might do rather well with a Corbyn government at Westminster and none of the constraints on a Corbyn government that the EU currently imposes. I think they would do better than they would with the flow of money that comes from the EU uh, in, in these limited respects. I mean, it's not an enormous amount of money, actually. People get sort of fixated on these sums, but they're not huge actually, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I mean, just the way that people m misunderstand quite a lot about our economic relationship with the EU, you know, the famous fact the only country with which you have a trade surplus is Ireland, of any significance. And that's hard, it's hard to see that, whatever happens with Ireland, it's hard to see that going because of the thoroughgoing integration of the two economies.